Well, thank you so much, David, and thank you to Sage, actually, for inviting me. It's a great honor to be part of this conference. I'm going to share with you a few thoughts about the role of government in the 21st century economy. Okay, so I, I am going to now share, right? So I'm going to argue that the role of government is really a matter of balance, a balance between various things. And I'm going to start with uh, the division of labor between the political side, which is the executive and legislative, and something which is more independent from uh, politics, so the independent agencies, and ultimately the private sector, of course. So there is a big question in the West about whether the state is back. Um, to some extent it is. There is a renewed popularity of industrial policy, and there are also plans for reshoring. Of course, after COVID, where there was some disruption of supply chains, uh, some I'm saying because actually they held up pretty, pretty well, uh, given the circumstances. But of course, now with the invasion of Ukraine, we also have disruption in supply chains. Um, of course, this is the not the most important part of the war, but there is still, uh, if you think, for example, about neon, which is used uh, for chips, 50% uh, of it is being produced in Ukraine. Now, the reshoring is that a short-term uh, reaction or a permanent trend? Um, I just want to point out that there are alternatives to reshoring. One is geopolitical diversification. Uh, the other one is, of course, the storage of uh, essential inputs if we have only a short-term crisis. And the second point I want to make is that there are limits to reshoring. So, um, the first is that you cannot have access to what the entire world has to offer to you. And therefore, there is a loss of welfare, a loss of budgeting power. The second point is that the creation of international supply chains is very much like a fixed cost. And once it has been spent, it's sunk. And, you know, for example, for the Western companies to invest in China, it actually was a big investment. But now this investment has been made. So that suggests that maybe there will be some reshoring, but not a huge amount. My vision of the modern state, um, I see the state as a regulator, a uh, referee, and is going in that, in that manner to uh, correct market failures. So market failures, I refer you to my book, Economics for the Common Good. You can think of that as being, for example, externality. So for example, carbon emissions, uh, and try to make sure that the general interest coincide with the individual interest and reduce emissions. Uh, it can be market power. That's why we have competition policy. It can be a consumer lack of information. That's why we have food safety regulation or banking regulation. That could be inequality, of course, because there is no reason why the market is going to deliver the proper distribution of income and wealth and so on and so forth. So it's basically a market fixer and a regulator or referee. Of course, the state has to be an enabler for, by providing various infrastructure, like the legal framework. So a good legal framework is, of course, very important for economic growth. Where I will be more reluctant is to have the state as a producer, um, because in that matter, it's less efficient than the market and the private sector. Let me see why. So state-owned enterprises, SOEs, are often inefficient for several reasons. The first is that they are given often a fuzzy mission. So, you know, what they are trying to optimize is not completely clear. Uh, they have conflicting objectives. So, for example, they are being asked to be profitable. But at the same time, they may be asked to support the local industry or do various other things. The second danger, of course, is that the government may actually select buddies uh, for the top corporate jobs as a reward. But, you know, this may not be the most uh, appropriate uh, appointments. The third issue is the so-called soft budget constraint. So the fact that if a state-owned enterprise uh, loses money and is about to go bankrupt, then in general, the government is going to bail it out. And of course, the anticipation of bailouts is going to create more hazard. So the, the, the managers are going to be less concerned about losing money. Uh, they will put less effort into uh, avoiding losses. And finally, the state-owned enterprise may, in some cases, lobby the government so as to have no competitors at all because, of course, a monopoly has a quiet life. 
Another remark I want to make um, is that uh, the, uh, there's a loss of power of the state in France and Europe. Uh, there has been over the last 40 years. Uh, before that, there was actually a gain of power uh, by the state, which, was, uh, uh, which went together with a very welcome rise in the welfare state. So we built a welfare state and therefore the state became more important. There were also some other reasons like uh, there were some nationalizations after World War II, especially in France. However, from the 1980s on, uh, there was what I would call a triple whammy. Um, uh, first, there was some privatization of those state-owned enterprises. Then there was a globalization with a lower cost of, of, of doing trade with uh, trade agreements starting in the 80s, 90s, and so on. And that globalization, of course, created more competition. The market became more important um, at the expense a little bit to, of the state. In Europe, you had some other reason for why the state lost importance. In France, for example, you had the devolution in 1982 of power to the regions. And everywhere in Europe, you had the European construction, which meant that they, some of the power went to the upper echelon. And finally, we had a different state, which was the rise of independent agencies. I'm going to ask why, why did this happen? So to do that, we need to open the state's black box. You know, the state is a big thing. And you know, at the top, there's some kind of constitution. And the constitution is really about uh, the broad principle. Not, not very detailed, it's just uh, the values of society and what we want to achieve through the intervention of the state. It's a spirit of policymaking. Then the details, which are extremely important, of course, the letter is determined by various actors. Um, Co-petitors, um, which is um, with checks and balance, are going to fill out uh, the details. I'm going to explain why uh, I call them co-petitors, because basically they have to cooperate at the same time. They are not necessarily the same objective if they want to uh, implement the checks and balances. Now, I think checks and balances in general has a stabilizing effect of a public decision. So there are not huge swings uh, when, when the government changes. And it creates some competition in politics uh, because absolute power may corrupt. Monopoly, wherever it comes from, it can come from elite capture. There are lots of accusations of that in the West. The party or cliques or whatever, it's going to generally, the monopoly generates a feeling of superiority and impunity. And also group sync. So group sync is really when everybody thinks the same and nobody dares to present any contrary argument. And that's bad, of course, because after a while of group sync, then you end up with very bad decisions. Um, there's some, uh, some balance between the legislative and executive branch. And of course, there is also some balance between the civil service and the politicians. And there we have a longstanding debate about the difference between the civil service and the civil servants. So the civil service refers to a long-term institution that serves the public interest. Civil servant uh, is supposed to serve the interest of the government of the day. Of course, the government of the day in every country is going to say, I'm serving the public interest. But of course, there's no reason to believe that. It's not quite the case. And we have to be careful with the difference between civil service and civil servant. But in any case, what we need is some competition. So we need some cooperation, otherwise nothing is done. But at the same time, uh, the civil service and the legislative branch have, should not be yes men. Now that brings me to a different conception of the state, which is independent agencies. That's not a new conception. If you think about justice, for example, a basic principle of justice is that the government cannot be church and jury at the same time. Um, you need someone who is independent. And probably one of the first example was the British crown. The, just, ju the churches in, in England became independent um, in the early 18th century from the British crown. But of course, this idea that you need independent players in government um, extends. So, for example, that has been very important to develop antitrust without intervention from ministers in favor of some firms. 
that has been very important for regulation, industrial policy agencies, for central banks in most countries in the world now, central banks are independent. And that's how we were able to tame inflation, for example, and also to do better banking regulation. And we want to avoid the prevalence of lobbying, electioneering, rulers' interest into those decisions. Now, independence in general facilitated the protection. It protects, in a sense, uh, the, the agency from the temptation to pander, to please someone. So basically be more faithful to the mission, um, whether it's central banking or, or competition policy or, or whatnot, that, that basically makes it easier to fulfill the mission and to have more expertise-based public policy with a lot of transparency because the, uh, the, 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 the managers of the agency are not politicians, they are not reelected or anything. And therefore, they, they can explain very clearly why they took this decision and have a consultation very open where people who disagree express their views and so on. And that's, that's good. Now, I have to warn you an independent agency, and I like independent agencies, it's only as good as the quality of its staff. So in independent agency, if you put the wrong staff, it's not, it's not a good thing. So you have to find people who have expertise, who are independent from the government and from lobbies and are honest. So the selection process is very important. And the independent authorities also are never completely independent in that, um, you know, they take a decision and it cannot be challenged, but you know, over the years, of course, if it doesn't fulfill the mission, then you could have, for example, the parliament remove the head of the agency. Now, let me come to the second part of, uh, of my talk. Um, what creates trust in government? Now I'm going to look at a different kind of balance between the state and its clients, its users, the citizens and the companies. And I'm going to make four suggestions uh, for building trust. The first is kind of obvious, um, is to achieve bureaucratic efficiency. The state is there to, at the service of the people. And, and, and of course, when it's business of, of corporation, but it's basically at the service of the people. So it has to achieve a low cost of doing business and a low cost of being a citizen. So that implies that you should have simplicity of use. So it should be very easy to implement the various regulations that are designed by the government. And for employees, household, and companies, a maze of support mechanisms or regulation have very negative consequences. And one of them is obvious, which is that we may be spending a lot of time understanding and trying to take advantage of the rules. So in France, for example, but in many countries, you know, you try to, to find grants for everything you, you finance in universities, in, in business, and so on. Conversely, there can be discouragement because if it's too hard to find out how to do it, then there may be a low take up rate of the benefits. And it's not a fair mechanism anyway, because it rewards the people who do have the information. So we don't want that. So we have to achieve uh, bureaucratic efficiency. We have to also avoid a bloated state. So a bloated state uh, involves overstaffing too many people for doing the job. The swelling of, uh, of administration relative to operations. So for example, in school or hospital, you, you may have too many people doing administration, not enough people teaching or, or surgeons or the like. Um, a duplication of agencies or local authorities having similar prerogatives. So we need to, to avoid all those things. I have a few suggestions here and they are not new. I mean, they are just uh, kind of obvious. The first is evaluate, evaluate, evaluate um, the efficiency of the public sector. And of course, to do that, you need auditing agencies which are independent of the political powers. That is very important because the state cannot be judge and jury at the same time. In the evaluation, you can use benchmarking. So you systematically compare the performance of countries 
So with other countries, for example, how many teachers do they have? How, many, how much do they pay their teachers? And can you do better and get better education for your children? Between regions, between agencies, between universities and the like. So, for example, you, you can compare, you know, if you're a Western country and you want to do a reform of state, you, you can compare with the success stories of Sweden, Canada, or Australia, for example. Uh, sometimes to create benchmarking, you need to experiment. So if you have a unit form policy, that prevents comparing and seeing what works and what doesn't work. And, you know, China in the 80s and 90s actually did write that because the experimentation allowed China to see what works and what doesn't work. Um, and you have to share. So, you know, this is not going to go into a drawer. You, you need to share the evaluations with officials and, and citizens as well. Second recipe, in a sense, you have to ensure fair treatment. Uh, there is a frenzy of regulatory loopholes in, in many countries. So, for example, some people pay carbon tax, some people don't pay a carbon tax. You have different pension schemes. Um, you have lots of tax loopholes. Some people pay the taxes, others don't. You can have protection of competition in some industries and so on. And this is both inefficient and unfair. So it's inefficient because you don't meet the objectives. You don't reach the objectives that you have, uh, you have designed. But also in terms of political economy, that means that everybody is going to lobby the government to have and access to this exemption or obtain an override. It's unfair and it's going to create a feeling of inequity for those who do not have access to the loopholes. Third principle, you have to avoid hubris. You have to be humble when you're in government. And that's normal because, you know, government officials don't have all the information that is needed and that's quite, quite, you know, regulation is in big part an issue with information that you have. Um, but the consequence of that is that you have to realize that you don't have always information, so you should not design public intervention that are dependent on data that the public authorities do not possess. Otherwise, you are going to give, uh, you are going to create cronism and arbitrariness. And actually, insufficient information is why we are using so many, what I would call, untargeted policies. So R&D subsidies, that actually goes to every firm. Experience rating for layoffs. A uniform carbon price, which all economists almost recommend. Um, but sometimes we want, nonetheless, to use final information. So some kind of industrial policy that favors and supports specific industries, specific technologies of firms, and picks winner. But then it's very crucial that you adopt the proper governance. And in my book, Economics for the Common Good, in chapter 13, I, I list the best practices for industrial policy. So you must use independent qualified experts to select the project for public funding if you do industrial policy. So, you need to have the experts, say the scientists, for example, and they have to be independent. They're, they are not there to please the government. They are there to actually make things happen. You have to have pay attention to the supply, supply side. So you must see if I spend money there, are there the people who are going to make it happen? So you have to plant where the soil is fertile. You should not prejudge the solution. So if you, see, if you go back to COVID and the vaccines, when we thought about possible vaccines, we actually didn't know which, uh, which technology, you know, all style virus or viral vector or, or messenger RNA uh, would work. Nobody knew, nobody knew. And it turns out that uh, messenger RNA actually worked very well. And that was a little bit of a surprise. Um, so we should not prejudge a solution. We must have a goal, not, not select a technology. Uh, we have to evaluate the intervention, publish the results, withdraw support if the project doesn't work or is no longer needed. And we have to involve uh, private sector in risk taking. Surprisingly, uh, the role model there is DAPAI. So, you know, we are interacting through computers, and many of the computer technology actually come from 
fundamental research financed by uh, the DARPA, DARPA or DARPA E, E is for energy now, but at the, at the time that was about uh, computer science mainly. But other things uh, like uh, grant funding agencies for, for science in the universities and outside universities. That's very important if you want to actually achieve a good industrial policy. And my last point, which is very important, is that you have to address what I call time bombs. So what is a time bomb? A time bomb is a policy area where if you don't do anything for a year or two, it doesn't matter. So think about climate change. Um, if you don't act on climate change for a year or two years, it just doesn't make a big difference. No, almost no difference in the short term, and the entire difference will be in the long term. But of course, that means this is bad in a sense, because it means that you have pot political procrastination uh, with years or decades of inaction. Actually, in the case of climate change, we have had all over the world, except in a couple of countries like Sweden, basically in action, three decades of inaction because of this uh, uh, time issue, okay? And, and climate change is not the only example of that. Um, so if you think about education, it's the same thing. If you don't do anything for a year or two, it doesn't really matter, but of course, in the long term, it's a disaster. Uh, higher education, R&D, public debt, health prevention, uh, domestic and international harmony, uh, avoiding uh, repression and, 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 and belligerent attitudes. It's a short-term uh, policy, it's not a long-term solution. Um, now there's this debate about whether democratic or autocratic regimes are more prone to create uh, time bombs. The answer is, I don't know what the answer is. Um, it's true that um, in democratic countries, uh, politicians may privilege re-election and basically not act. Um, but at the same time, the, the autocratic regimes may be blinded by the absence of the democratic opposition or NGOs. And actually, if you see climate change, you have, you have uh, lots of procrastination in both camps. So let me stop here and, um, and just conclude. The governance of the state is very complex. Uh, it's a fuzzy, because it has a very fuzzy mission. And it's nonetheless extremely important. Um, the government may turn out to be extractive, or it may actually be a complement to economic activity. So what I've tried to do is to share with you a few thoughts on, on the good functioning. And I hope it's, it's, it has been useful. Uh, I wrote a report with Olivier Blanchard, if you are interested in reading it last year for, for the French presidency, but also for, the, for Europe more generally on some major economic challenges. And of course, I wrote a book a few years ago on economics for the economy. Thank you very much for inviting me and I look forward to your questions.